Hello, welcome to the channel and thanks for watching. This video is all about my homemade Zone Mortalis tiles, how I made them, how I cast them up in resin. You can see a resin tile there, 12 inch by 12 inch, that I'm now starting to make the scenery on top of. And I'll just show you through the process of getting to that stage. So what I started with is just a little plan and cut out some squares that you're looking at a six inch by six inch square, but I'm then putting nine one and three quarter inch squares on top of to represent a quarter of one of those tiles. So why quarter it, I suppose is question one. It gives more flexibility. So I plan to do four six inch quarters that we can then combine onto a 12 inch tile. Each quarter is going to be different to each other. So in theory, that gives hundreds of combinations to make the tiles kind of unique from each other. So that's the process. So I envisage each of these six inches representing a part of the floor of Necromunda. Like the floor gets bolted down, each of these nine panels is like an access panel. Underneath there would be the, you know, a hole to get to the services or the wiring or the whatever is underneath the floor of the, the hive. So that's what we're going to do. So each of these nine panels we've made of a different kind of metal kind of slabs. So we're doing that. Now what I'm doing to start with is cutting out out of plastic card some one and three quarter inch sections that the original intention was to use a green stuff wood roller on top of because my Necromunda figures are based uh, on a mesh kind of uh, system using the green stuff wood roller and some uh, milliput or green stuff on there for the base. So I've cut out some squares, started that process, just double check that they are the right size and then put some green stuff on there, use the green stuff wood roller uh, to roll and put the mesh print on. Now for me that didn't work in this case because there isn't enough of the roller to make the whole one and three quarter square the same material and it looked a bit higgledy piggledy. Um, look, the beautiful rollers, great on my bases, but not quite right for this. So abandoned that idea and got instead some textured plastic card. Now you can pick these up from model shops for you know a quid, two quid a sheet. Um, I used barely any of each sheet, so I've got three quarters of each sheet or more left. But I bought a series of different styles, so I wanted different style panels on the floor. So we got some like hexagon mesh, we've got some square mesh, we've got some that are mostly riveted, and I bought as well a nice thick plastic card for making the six inch squares out of, so relatively thick, only a couple of mils, so not too thick. Um, well, there we go. So then I cut the 16 squares out of the thick plastic card, you can see here, and that starts the template process for the rest of the build. And that, you know, make sure they're square as possible because when you cast them up, you want them to be sort of as neat as possible, but not too neat. Because again, when we're making these squares, you know, it is the underhive, so being a bit higgly piggly doesn't matter too much. So, with each different type of plastic card, I then cut out a series of one and three quarter inch squares so that we could represent that initial tile that I developed. Now, what I'm cutting through here is when you plan out the six inch square, one and three quarters, three times, leaves you obviously the gaps in between. You want them to be even because we've still got a bit of space left in that tile. So I just cut out a one eighth of an inch sort of size guide to go around the outer edge of the tile. Now the outer edge, I'm leaving less of a space between the very outer edge and the tile because when two tiles are put together, that will leave the same sort of two eighths of an inch um, spacing. Now working inches because that's what Necromunda and the games work in and I tend to work in but obviously you could do the same in centimetres and just plan it out. Now what it does mean is the gaps in between the tiles that aren't touching the edge, the gaps will be slightly wider, we should get an even approach across the whole tile then. So now it's just a case of gluing these individual plastic card squares down onto the tiles. You'll see later on the patterns that I glue them down in, um, broadly the same, you could completely mix them but what I've done is I've used um, the same plastic card in the same places in the tile, so give it a little bit of um, evenness because you imagine when the hive was first built they would have built it in the same way, gives a nice pattern, but then on each tile I've glued less down on some tiles more on others. So you see here we've um, sealed them down, they're put on, that's a complete tile, I've done one complete tile and on the others I've left one or two pieces off and one I've left quite a lot of bits off and you'll see why shortly. So here's where we're at the, the build so far. Now the one where we've left multiple tiles off what I want to do is actually cut through the tile so that this then represents um, them going into the underneath of um, the underhive I suppose. So I've made a slightly smaller square that um, fits completely on as you saw there onto one of those squares and I will now slice around it and cut out these holes. So it looks like the panels that cover the underhive floor have been lifted off and you can then access into the bowels of the hive whether that be to get to the electrics or piping or whatever. So um, I've done one tile quite you know chopped up like this, the others I've just left it because I'm going to make little squares to go over. So I've only cut the holes onto one side of one tile which again you will see later. 
We talked before about these big tiles are being fixed to the floor of the Underhive. And this is the floor, so how are we going to do that? So what I picked up is a rivet maker from Green Stuff World. Um, it's a little bit of cast silicon I think it's made out of that's got a series of different rivet styles already embossed into there. So effectively, um, this is a pre-bought version of the mold I'm going to make at the end of this to make the entire tile. Just mixed up some green stuff, picked the couple of rivet styles that I like the look of, and you literally fill um, these molds with green stuff in this case. I'm sure there's other things you could fill it with. I chose to use green stuff, good strength, good flexibility, uh, and it feels like that would work. So just prodding it right into the tile. Now I didn't um, push it in my hand, I did use a bit of a material to do it because you can push it right into the mould. So there you go. So I've picked a couple of the rivet styles that I liked. I'm only using one style in the end, but you know it's good to test kind of these things. It's a good bit of kit that I'm going to have knocking around. So here's the completed rivets after it's had time to dry. Um, and these are what I'm then going to put onto this tile to make it look like this is how it's been bolted on for the underhive. So if you look at the style of rivet, um, very similar to a lot of Necromunda rivets you will see on official terrain, so really nice. And this is what we're going to do to make it look like it's been bolted on again. So all we're doing now is clean it up a little bit, because um, the bottom, obviously, when you push the green stuff in, you can leave bumps and lumps coming out of the bottom of the mould. So just tidy the bottom up slightly, and then I super glue these down to my tiles. Now I've only glued it around the middle panel because in my head, I don't know why, but for some reason I feel that this entire panel will be lifted in by some sort of big industrial equipment and then they bolt the tile down using these four big bolts in the middle of this tile. You could do more and you could do rivets in a whole row along the tile but I don't want to go too crazy with these tiles. You could put more and more and more detail on and that would cast up absolutely fine but I just want them as a fairly simple plain um, basis to build up my Necromunda tiles from. So I want enough detail for interest, but I don't want so much detail that gives me less customization. So this is now the completed tile. You can see there where I've cut the holes right through. You can see the variety. Now I've, what I've done is I've left one of the corner panels off on several of them because I've got a plan for doing like a kind of big access hatch that I'll mold and model on probably in a later video. So those are the four tiles we've got. Now it's about casting them up so we can easily use them. So what I've taken is the underside of my big cutting mat and I'm just taking a hot glue gun and I'm gluing down pieces of foam board to, rep to make the uh, mould box for when we pour in the rubber mould in a minute. Now when you're doing this you want to leave, oh, I've left about a centimetre along the side of each of the pieces just so that there's enough space for the rubber to kind of go in. Now I'm using um, a hot glue gun to glue them down, a couple of reasons, um, quick and easy is one. But secondly, it doesn't make a mess of your cutting board and it will pull off afterwards. If you start super gluing these mold boxes and stuff down, you will ruin your cutting board. Now I'm using the underside, so if it does get any damage, you know, it's not so much of a problem. But I, I don't want to have to throw this away after making one mold box. So this is what we're doing. Now before we pour the mold, this is the night before, I'm just taking some PVA glue and I'm painting it onto the very edges of the tiles. And then I'm going to stick this tile down into each of the mold boxes. Again, a couple of reasons. Uh, stops it moving when you pour the rubber on so it's not going to you know shift and maybe move slightly in it and also it stops the rubber going under the tile and making a bit of an issue so here's the silicon rubber that i'm going to use to make the mold i'll put links down below if you're going to use the same stuff it comes in two parts the first is the actual rubber the second is this red catalyst that you use to obviously make the rubber start to to set and cure now it's a 10 to 1 mix so use a scale use an old pot that you'd you know, you don't uh, ever want to use again for anything other than doing this. You'll see mine, I've used it multiple times, so it's a bit scratched and battered. However much catalyst you put in, you need to put 10 times more of the actual rubber product in. That's how this one particularly works. Now, I always put the catalyst in first rather than second, because then when you pour the rubber on top, it starts to mix it as well, and it makes the mixing process a lot easier. I find it a lot harder work putting the rubber in first and then the catalyst, because you've got to really, really mix it, and it can be quite problematic. You'll see here as I'm pouring the rubber in, it's kind of going flowing through the catalyst. The catalyst is rising up, but in theory, that means some catalyst has touched every piece of rubber before we start stirring. That's just how I've found uh, making these rubber moulds um, works. Now, I have done a video that I has published just before this video on the same day about getting air out of rubber moulds. 
So check that out if you want. I'll put a link down below because obviously the, the less air that is in this rubber mold, the better. Now, the mold we've made here, you don't need to use a vacuum chamber or the process I showed in the other video to get the air out because there's a lot of air space. So the, the bubbles will rise out of this material quite easily in the mold we're making. But if you are going to get into casting uh, miniatures or scenery with this, it's something worth putting in your arsenal. So check that video out about getting air out of rubber molds. So all we do now is we give it a really good stir to mix in the two uh, materials so that this will be able to start to be used. Now a point to note here, eye protection, vital, so don't flick it into your eye. I wear glasses so it's not generally an issue and it is really worthwhile wearing gloves. Now I'm not because I've used what's called liquid gloves that you put on uh, and it stops any chemicals and stuff on your hands. Only useful if you get a little splash on it. If you're going to get yourself covered in it, you know, do wear gloves. But I've kind of rubbed this on um, and I've actually don't really generally splash myself because I've done this quite a lot. But do put some gloves on if, if you know, you've never done this before and you're not super careful. I will link down below the liquid glove stuff that I do use. So you can check that out if you fancy it. So now it's pouring the mould into the mould box onto these um, tiles we made. Now remember this is the following day from when I've glued these tiles down so that they're not going to lift and the glue is kind of set. Pour from a height, you want a nice thin stream because that will minimise any air that goes in. Um, and just pour till you've got maybe half a centimetre of a layer above. Now the more rubber you use, the more secure the mould will be, but the more expensive it's going to get. Now I used on this probably um, three quarters of a litre of rubber because I made them quite sturdy because I want to use these moulds again and again and again and again. Um, so you wouldn't necessarily need to use that much, but that was about maybe... 16, 17 quid's worth of, of rubber. So obviously that factors into the cost. If the main reason we're doing these, these tiles for you is cost, that will all factor in. It all still work out significantly cheaper though. So now it's about demolding. Once the rubber has set, which I left it well overnight, I left it 24 hours, you then literally break the side of the mold box off and peel it off. And you see here, it's made a really nice uh, mold effect. There'll be a couple little bits you need to kind of pick off and clean up, there always is. But really that looks like it's gone quite well. Um, here's the piece where I clearly forgot to put some PVA glue around the actual holes. You can see there where the rubber has seeped underneath. That's important why we stuck it down because if we hadn't done that around the other edges, this whole thing would have lifted and, and given us a problem. So a bit more to tidy up there. You can see where obviously the PVA hadn't dried and some of the mould started creeping under. So you can imagine what would have happened if we hadn't glued any of it down at all. So really um, demold it, clean the moulds up to a certain level. You can see here is one that's been uh, a little bit cleaned up. And now these moulds are thoroughly ready to use. I would always leave an extra 50% on top of the rubber drying time, whatever they recommend, leave it an extra 50% just so you're really sure that these things are cured properly before you use it. Because when you use resin, particularly the type we're gonna use, it heats up and things, and you want the mold to be really, really secure before you do. So now we're using a two-part resin to cast these pieces. Again, a weight-based one. I'll link that down below, the one I'm particularly using. I find the weight-based mix is much easier. You see here, this is the, the resin we use, and this is a two kilo kit that I bought. Um, weight based is easier because you just literally get a set of scales, pour one lot in, pour the other lot in. If it's a volume based measure or um, whatever, it's a little bit more fiddly. Still not a problem. I mean, look, use what you can get, use what you feel uh, is particularly good. So you literally weigh it twice, pour the first part in, reset the scales. I'm now pouring the second part of this mix in and then it's stirring it again, same as you've seen before. So once you've got both parts in and you're confident with how much um, volume of resin you've got, then it's time to pour. Now, you can test how much resin you need by pouring water into the mold, for example, and pouring it out, and that'll give you a good idea of what you're after, or one trick I've done on certain molds is you pour rice in, that you then again pour out, and it gives you an idea about the rough volume that you need for that mold. In this case here, I literally took a stab, <laughs> had a go, happened to get it roughly right, but you'll see in a second, the first pour I did, I did a little bit too much resin, um, and as I went through the, the process, I eventually learnt how much I needed. So for your reference, I've made a four by four board out of about 30 pounds worth of resin. So a fairly significant um, saving on um, what you would you know, spend on actual Zone Mortalis tiles. Now obviously, not that I recommend this, you could just cast up the Zone Mortalis tiles if you wanted and it would probably work out cheaper, but really not something I would overly recommend because obviously there's probably moral rules about this. So when we're pouring the resin in, again, pour a fairly thin stream. What I did here is I poured into the center of the mold and let it flow out. Now this was semi a mistake here because I've ended up putting too much resin in, um, allowing gravity to pour out. So I've never molded something quite uh, as big a flat panel. What I ended up doing in the later pours was using the stick that I'd stirred with to kind of 
help the resin round the whole mold and actually it cut down the amount of resin I used quite dramatically. Um, so that was just a learning for me. Another thing I learned, and you'll see when we demold in a second, that later on I, I took the resin stick and just prodded it into where the rivets are just to push the air out. I didn't bother on the first pour because I thought that actually with the space the air would just come out, but it didn't. So you can see here they've, uh, the cast is starting to cure. So again, looking quite good and it's filled every space. Now here's what I mean about too much resin. I don't know if you could tell on that shot, but you could see it slightly raised above the level of the mold so future castings i put less in helped it around with a stick so now it's the demolding stage uh, this is a fairly quick set resin it starts to cure after about four or five minutes you haven't got a lot of working time but it doesn't mean you can demold fairly quickly as well although obviously you can leave it longer uh, shorter it's entirely up to you so it comes off fairly cleanly no damage to the mold because again i've made them slightly thicker than necessary so i want to use them a lot the only flaw in these first castings as i said before was the rivets have not cast you can see there was an air bubble trapped at the bottom of each of those rivet holes so i need to obviously address that now all, all i did to address that in the later pourings was use the stick and i just stab the stick onto where those um, the nuts and bolts are in the mold and it just pushed the air out got some good castings later but apart from that actually the the actual um, cast as a holes come out really nicely really sharp and clean a little bit thicker than I wanted again the same thing there I let the kind of meniscus build up um, so it domed it slightly so poured slightly less resin into each one now if you make a mold obviously if your molds are probably a different size to what I make slightly then there will be variations but it worked out in the end that each of these pieces when I'd you know, experimented a little bit and cast up a few more uh, was taking only 80 mil of resin so 40 mil of one part 40 mil of the other so you know that's what I was using you see here just test fitting the four pieces together worked really well and um, very nicely then what I did is carried on that test and you can see here the massive batch of uh, plates that I've made um, with that kind of process so i'll pick up an early one here uh, to hunt through because obviously every other one after that went uh, perfectly fine once i realized my mistake you see the first one with the rivet problems with the bubbles and then again i said after every single cast of that i just prodded it in and you can see the rivets have printed out really nicely as well um, and a good depth to the tile what i also did um, with some resin near the end was made some like partial castings and poured on blobs of resin just on in random let it flow randomly because i want to do some broken up and damaged sections in the hive and that'd be really interesting so i've drawn a very quick two by four plan that i'm going to work on first with a bit of a train a repair shop a broken gunk tank and a few plans i've got i also started knocking about with some ideas for how i'm going to fill those empty panels where i'm not accessing the underhive so again having a bit of a play of what future plans are so i'm not going to show you what i'm making in future but keep an eye on the channel and you will see those panels come into life now we're back to the original shot i hope you like that if that made some sense to you like comment subscribe check me out on instagram facebook check the links below and i'll see you next time